Welcome to Sunday Night Prime. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, a member of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal, and happy to be your host for tonight's wonderful program. Our program tonight is entitled Missionaries for the Year of Faith. But before we get into this very important program, I'd like to mention if you have any questions or comments, send your emails to Sunday Night Prime at EWTN.com. Again, Sunday Night Prime at EWTN.com. We've been getting a lot of wonderful uh, emails. Please keep them coming. A lot of suggestions for good programs, and I'm working on that. Well, you know, we're going to talk about missionaries in this year of faith because our faith tells us that we've got to all be missionaries and at least having that spirit of wanting to bring Christ out to others, the new evangelization. This is what Pope John Paul II talked about, Pope Benedict talked about it, now Pope Francis is talking about that, to bring Christ out to others. You know, the word missionary comes from the Latin, it's a Latin verb, mitere missus. There's a parts of the, the Latin uh, language there, but we get from that verb in Latin, we get the word missionary. It means someone who's sent, someone who's been sent. And uh, the Greek word for missionary is apostle. And that's why the 12 whom Jesus chose, and they're called the apostles, the 12 apostles, he said to them, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. See, we're sent with a mission, a mission from Christ. Now, all of us, as I mentioned, by our baptism, are called to have a missionary spirit. We have to bring Christ out to the world. We have to be a good example, preach the word, but especially, you know, to help others to come to know Jesus. Well, in the church, though, we have those who are called in a very special way to dedicate their life to a missionary uh, task, uh, to accomplish the task Jesus is sending them to. And tonight, for our program, we're very privileged to have a very special guest, and it's Father Andrew Small. He is the National Director of the Pontifical Mission Societies. Father Andrew, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me here with you. Oh, it's a pleasure. We have Father Andrew and Father Andrew. <laughs> okay, so don't get it you know, mixed up, but uh, uh, it's wonderful to have you. I know Father Andrew also, too, from the Archbishop Fulton Sheen Foundation. We are both on the foundation, That's right? That's correct. We're both board members trying to uh, make his life and his, his, his sacrifice known around the world. Yes, so important, isn't it, it Father? Is. And Father, you are his successor. <laughs> well, <laughs> I have the job that he once held. I, I hate to use the word success because uh, he has such a tremendous legacy, and even today his legacy is uh, far and wide, so I, I very much have my small feet in those large shoes, if you, if you put it that way. Yes, yes. Yeah, he is uh, a very difficult uh, uh, person to follow. I remember when he ordained me, you know, and after, after the ordination, he came to the dinner we had at the friary, and he got up and gave a talk, and then he turned to me, he said, all right, Father, why don't you give him a couple of words? I said, he's a tough act to follow Bishop Gene, that's what you know, especially as a, a speaker. But Father, it's such a pleasure to have you on tonight. You know, uh, I'm sure that our, our viewers would like to know a little bit of your background. You have a very interesting background. Sure, yes, no, happy to talk a little bit about that. Not too much about myself, but uh, obviously a Catholic priest, uh, ordained uh, in the last year of the last millennium, 1999, okay. uh, which probably doesn't seem like too far away for most people. Uh, I'm a member of a religious congregation, a missionary congregation, called the Missionary Oblates of Mary Immaculate, which I'm sure is familiar with many folks. Uh, we're in about 50 or so countries, oh. uh, about four and a half thousand of us. Like many congregations, we were started after the uh, the terrible ravaging of the French Revolution on the church in southern France uh, in the early 1800s. And our founder was a nobleman like St. Francis in many ways who gave up his noble background. And he realized that in all the talk of progress that was going on in the wake of this uh, freedom, liberty uh, movement of the French Revolution, he noticed that the, the simple people were being left behind. So he committed himself with a group of diocesan clergy, diocesan priests, to go out into the, the countryside and to speak the language of the people, which was called Provençal. It's the local language. It wasn't the, the high French of the, of the aristocracy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he went out and preached popular missions, and then from there he went, we went to Sri Lanka and Canada and England and all around the world, and here I am all those years later. But we keep that missionary thrust, and I think for us, Oblates, we do see a world which 
uh, believes almost a little too much in the notion of progress and everything's moving forward and and maybe we can leave God out of the picture and maybe we can leave religion out of the picture. And of course, we know we're lost when that happens. So I think, as you mentioned, the new evangelization for us as oblates uh, and for all of us as Catholics and as missionaries is as essential today as it was after that great turmoil of the French Revolution. Yes, and that's right rooted in the gospel, isn't it? You know, when, uh, when the, you know, how shall we, you know, faith comes through hearing, and how shall we hear unless someone preach, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? Huh? And there's so. a great tyranny, just you, I was listening to you talk about uh, Andrew Apostoli, Father Andrew Apostoli. Andrew, of course, was the first to be chosen, and uh, Apostoli comes from Apostolos, so you have it all wrapped into yeah. your one name, which yeah. is... People ask me if I got the name Apostoli when I entered the religious life. I said, no, I got it when I entered the world. I said it was my father's best name. That's beautiful. <laughs> but uh, part of the tyranny I think that people feel is uh, they're supposed to figure it all out themselves, especially young people are sold this, this, uh, this falsehood, really, that uh, the world is yours to make of it whatever you want. Uh, and they can sort of get trapped in this ideology, uh, which can be a terrible pressure on people. The thing about being an apostle or a missionary is that you are sent, and if you're sent, you're sent by another. Right. So if you're sent, you always have that relationship with the one who sends you. In the beginning of St. John's Gospel, we know that Christ uh, was sent from the bosom of the Father, the second person of the Trinity, to go to become like us in all things but sin. But He was sent from the Father, and as He said, and as you said, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. I think if we keep that relationship with the one who sends, we'll know, we'll know where to go when, when things don't always go the way we thought they should go. Right. If we stay close to him, that's right. Hey. As uh, as we were just hearing, Cardinal, the great Cardinal John O'Connor was famous for writing and saying, "If we stay close to him, the one who sends us, we won't go far wrong." And that's I right. think that's at the heart of the missionaries' right. uh, right. missionaries' task and the missionaries' work. That's right. And you know, it's also that faithfulness to the mission he gives us. And you know, today we've had so many. Uh, in the last number of years, uh, we hear so many people giving their opinions instead of teaching of the church. And, uh, you know, that's not what Jesus wants us to do. He wants us to be faithful to Him. Give the message I gave you to give to the people. You know, we need a good reminder. And I think what you're saying, Father. One important. of the things I didn't tell you too much about it, I, I, was a, uh, I, trained, I studied law and trained in law before I became a, 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 a priest. Mm -hmm. And then I taught it for a little while in law school uh, just uh, a few years ago. But one of the famous... Uh, uh, kernels of, of, uh, of, of the common law system is you can't give what you yourself have not received. Nemo dat quod non habet is the, is the yeah, famous right. Latin expression. And I think that's exactly the case. We can't be evangelizers unless we ourselves are being evangelized by the word itself, not by what floats on the, on the wind or what our opinions uh, that suit us for that particular day or that particular situation. And it's the fullness of that faith and the truth which I think is, is, is at the heart of falling in love with the truth and the beautiful and the God who is all in all, or, or, or we see him in our daily lives so that we can bring that to others. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's the beauty and that's something that in that bringing, we also uh, change ourselves. I mean, we're, right. we're, we're not people with this large bucket and we fill all the little buckets. We know that God's spirit is alive and active in the world mm -hmm. and we become closer to God the more that we engage our world and engage particularly those who are struggling at the margins of society. That's right. Oh, so very important. And I'm sure as your, your missionary work, uh, your own personally, and the work that you direct throughout the, the United States and the world. Huh? Uh, I know, uh, Father Andrew, you had told me you had spent some time in uh, Brazil yeah. as a missionary. How long were you? Sure, I, was at, I went shortly after ordination there. I went in the year 2000, for a year or so. And uh, I was in a, uh, they call them favelas, although that's not a Portuguese word, it's not a Brazilian word, uh, just outside of Rio de Janeiro. Mm -hmm. um, we had 27 communities, and it was not always possible to have mass everywhere every Sunday. But you'd get round to all the communities within, within the month, uh, mm -hmm. and then they'd have another visit with the pastoral councils because they were very focused on, uh, on the local community. They did, just didn't have the personnel. Mm -hmm. I think there were about maybe 35 priests for one and a half million uh, wow, Catholics about, yeah. uh, in the diocese just north of Rio. 
after that, I was assigned to the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, mm -hmm. uh, which I think had about 150 priests for the same amount of, of Catholics. So you can see why um, the need today is as great as it's ever been. People say, sure. well, are we still doing the mission? Surely everyone's heard of Jesus at this stage. What have we been doing? The needs are great for people to celebrate the sacraments, to learn about the faith, mm -hmm. to study the, the Holy Word, uh, and to gather around the table of the Lord. Uh, it's, an, it's an urgent call and it's a pressing call. Sure. And, uh, and it's also a joy. Yes, yes. And, and you know, uh, Father Andrew too, you know, like you said to the people to hear, hear about Jesus, but how many, you know, the Holy Father in calling the year of faith has reminded us how many have lost their way. Sure. They need to hear it again. We got to recycle them. <laughs> you know, recycling is a big thing. So we got to recycle a lot of Catholics because they've drifted away from their faith, forgotten it, never maybe even learned it very well to begin with. I think you know? that's that's so, the clue. Yeah, the people maybe weren't really apprised of the beauty of our faith, and that's why mm -hmm. uh, they don't feel that passion for it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, how'd you find yourself coming into the work at the propagation of the faith there? Well, I worked, as I, I mentioned, in Houston for a few years in a, in a, in a Latino parish, so was mostly d did most of my uh, primary priestly work in another language, Spanish, uh, Portuguese mm -hmm. and, yeah, and, and then Spanish. Spanish. Uh, and then I came back to do some graduate studies at Catholic University to finish my doctorate. And I got shoehorned a little bit into working with the Bishop's Conference, talking about uh, the, the global poverty issues around the world and how we as a great country uh, are able to do something about that. We do have some resources and means and, and American Catholics and Americans in general are very generous when it comes to the needs of others around the world. So I was helped to, to do that and, and part of my work, uh, I, I ended up in the chair after that terrible earthquake in Haiti in 2010. Mm, yes. Uh, over 200, 250,000 people have tragically lost their lives in an earthquake that wasn't particularly uh, strong compared to other earthquakes. It was just that the houses and the shelters and the seminaries uh, that had been built in Haiti over the past 30 years were extremely unstable. So the tragedy obviously was the earthquake, but the earthquake compounded by just terrible construction. Yeah. So many souls lost their lives. So I worked quite uh, collaboratively with other groups to try and ensure that that didn't happen again. And Catholics were very generous uh, after that earthquake, as they often are. Um, from that work, as I say, no, no, do, no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, I got a call from Cardinal Dolan one day who said, uh, well, you're coming to New York, you're the new national director. <laughs> Fill in the shoes of Archbishop Fulton Sheen, which made me tremble a little bit. Uh -huh. uh, and I've been doing that since July of 2011. So That's uh, wonderful, Father. Enjoy. Well, keep up your wonderful work uh, because uh, we need you. We need that kind of leadership. Um, you know, to inspire uh, people to be conscious, first of all, of the missions. And, uh, you know, one of the great quotes, right? Isn't there a great quote about Bishop Sheen and the missions? Well, the, he said the, his greatest passion was, was the missions. I mean, he had, he's known for so many things. Uh, but I think he got an awful lot of joy out of seeing people hearing about Jesus and, and following him, you know, for the first time. Yeah. It was the great l passion of his life. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and that's an infectious passion. Yeah. Well, he, he seemed to bring together, remember when St. Paul said, God gives us apostles and prophets and uh, uh, teachers and uh, with pastors, and oh. there was one more in there too, uh, evangelists. And he was all of those, sure. wasn't he? Yeah. And, and as an apostle, I mean, he went out and worked with the churches in the foreign missions and the, the stories that he would tell and... Uh, of his own experiences and, uh, and then uh, in his own personal life, you know, the, the greatness of his love. I mean, when he spoke, and you can still hear it in his tapes and his talks, you know, the word came out with a force that is not simply human, there's a, the Spirit of God uh, really, I mean, the man was on fire. You know, I had the privilege of being ordained by him and sure. I, I just uh, always felt that that was a very, very special grace because uh, you know, he inspired you to know uh, exactly what it meant to be a priest. You're, you know, you're not only a priest with Christ, but you're, that, remember you always said the victim with Christ. Sure. Said, That's the uniqueness oh, of yes. the priesthood of Christ, to be a priest and a victim with Jesus. He, he was both, you know. So, and I know we've got a lot to be talking about now, but we'll talk about him and, and a little bit more in his, uh, his great work as the head of the propagation there 
uh, and uh, but what we're going to do, Father Andrew, we're going to take a little break okay. now. Okay, so don't go away. As someone said, used to say, don't change that ch channel. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Bye -bye. Welcome back to Sunday Night Prime. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, your host tonight, and our very special guest is Father Andrew Small, who is the National Director of the Pontifical Mission Societies, also known as the Propagation of the Faith. Faith. Okay, Father Andrew, it's been wonderful uh, having you here on the program, and you're talking, we ended up talking about Bishop Sheen, Archbishop Sheen, who was your, one of your predecessors in your very work there. And I know uh, you spoke uh, about before the program we had talked and you mentioned of his great passion, you know, what drove him and, and the, the work he did. I, I, I love the way you put it, what inspiration. <laughs> That's right. No, I mean, people often wonder what, what, what was it that made him tick, you know, because there's certainly been nothing like him since. I think we can say we look for some of his contemporaries and who would be the sheen of today. There are some candidates, I certainly am not one of them, but I don't think anybody really comes up to the ankles yeah. Yeah. Uh, of the great, and not just because he was a pioneer in TV and radio, just his entire narrative and his life story. People yeah. certainly as good as him, but he had that X factor, I suppose, that, as the kids would say today, uh, which still speaks. I think that's what makes him, in some sense, ultra contemporary. I mean, I speak to, to people who either have fallen away somewhat from the church uh, or they didn't really know that much about the Catholic Church. They had a vague sense of of religion. Uh, I was down in Texas, uh, you get this general sense of religion in the air, in the ether, but no real, uh, nothing real systematic Concrete. about what it is yeah. that we yeah. that we believe. And they would know, they would know uh, Archbishop Sheehan. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a whole new generation of those who never remembered those days, uh, and I'm one of them obviously, um, but they've become very passionate about seeing him on, on, on the internet or his tapes or his videos. He's a man, when you mention Archbishop Sheen, uh, people prick up their ears a lot. So, um, so I put a few, little, uh, a few little pieces that we had from the office just to uh -huh. try and th I thought folks might be a little bit interested to see, sure. uh, not behind the curtain as such, but uh, because it, uh, he's the real deal. You know, he, he, right. he walked the talk. But he was also, uh, uh, apart from anything else, an extremely smart man. This wasn't, uh, this wasn't somebody who just flashed his personality and, and everybody would swoon. This was somebody who had substance, uh, clarity. He was systematic. Uh, he had depth. And he had that great turn of phrase, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, he there did. Were two, there were two men hanging on the cross either side of Jesus. One is asking Jesus to take him down. The other is asking him to take him up. Mm -hmm. Where do you get that from? I know. If not from a deep sense of, of prayer and of proximity to the Lord. I brought something people might be a little interested in. Uh, he used to do his, uh, his weekly uh, TV show. That's uh, right. Yes, Life is Worth Living. And this was actually his script, believe it or not, from one, one of, of the his programs, TV yeah. shows. Mm -hmm. uh, he would put down the ideas and he put down his few points. And this was exactly the length of the TV show, which is why he used this every week. And he would give it to his, uh, his assistant, and uh, she would type it up, and then it would be there as a, as a little cheat sheet. Uh, but it's like an, an outline of a book just in itself. The interesting feature, and again, there's a lot of uh, folklore, I would imagine, as well, but I think this is, uh, on the scale, this is pretty true is that he would deliver this speech to the staff in the national office where, where, where I, I currently work. There were different staff, but yes, uh, sure. the staff sure. at the time. Uh -huh. um, and he would do it in French because, of course, he studied in Louvain. Uh, he got his uh, right. advanced degrees. Right. So his French was perfect. He, he, he's, I think he's Italian as well, obviously his Latin. He was a great philosopher and a great teacher. So he would do it in French because he said, if I can do it in French, which is you know, obviously going that step further, then uh, then it's going to be a lot easier for me when I actually deliver it in English. Isn't that amazing, huh? 
Because people would wonder, you know, how does he remember? The, you know, he had a f couple of notes and, you know, he had those uh, f joke at the beginning and whatnot. But it was clearly focused as, as the great professor and teacher that he was on leading people through something substantial. It wasn't just a series of ideas and anecdotes. He was getting you so that you understood your faith mm -hmm. and could, one, defend your faith, and two, which is the society that he was the head of, propagate. That's right. Bring that faith to others. So I thought that'd be an interesting little, yeah. Uh, yeah. little feature of his, uh, <laughs> of his work. As I was saying to you beforehand, he was, if anything, 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Mm -hmm. uh, he worked hard. Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah, I remember some, him doing once on one of his shows. He said he spent approximately 20 hours to prepare for a one-half-hour show. Right. That is enormous, you know, when you kind of think of it. But in those days, it was all live, so he had to really be on his toes to make sure that, uh, you know, there was no re-recording re or correcting this or that. So he had to get it all out straight the first time, which is an amazing thing. And of course, he was a brilliant teacher then. I remember all those years, well, it was, I think it was 24 years, he taught at Catholic University right. in Washington, D.C. And uh, even then, his classes were so uh, popular that many people who weren't taking his course sat in on his classes just to listen to him. You know? and, he, and he must have picked up in that back and forth um, you know, how to, how to get through some of the tough times. You know, these weren't all mm -hmm. yes people. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. College kids can be a little, uh, little argumentative oh, at times. Yeah, argument, yeah. There was a famous time there was somebody, because not everybody went with this. There were those who were his naysayers. And, you know, people yeah. he'd meet on the street didn't particularly care for uh, what he was saying and what he was doing and whatnot. Apparently there was a, but he was very quick. There was, apparently there was a, a guy who shouted, he was talking about Jonah in the belly of the whale. I yeah, don't know whether you know this story, and some guy shouted out about, well, how do you know that? So he obviously had a heckler in the, in the yeah. audience. He says, well, the Bible tells me so. He says, well, how do you really know? He says, well, uh, uh, I, when I go to heaven, I'll, I'll ask him. And the man shouted back, well, what if he's not there? <laughs> and, and, and Archbishop Sheehan said, well, then you ask him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'd heard something along that line. That story, great, but as a sharp, he was sharp. Yeah. Did you ever hear the story where when he was on radio, when he was Monsignor, because he was on the radio for 20 years, the Catholic Hour, which was a half hour program. It was around six o'clock on a Sunday after late Sunday afternoon, you know. And uh, so he was popular. I think he had between four and seven million people, they estimate, listened to him. And, uh, but nobody knew, you know, not that many people knew what he looked like. So the, he was at St. Patrick's Cathedral one day, and he was standing by the door uh, to the cathedral, and a man comes walking in, and he sees him with the Roman collar, didn't know who he was. And he said, you know what, Father, uh, I'd like to go to confession. And he says, you know, uh, that uh, Monsignor Sheen, he made a comment, and he upset a couple of my Protestant friends, and, you know, and I'm so angry at him, and I'm so upset and everything. And, and so <laughs> Bishop Sheen says to the man, look, don't worry about that. I know you did didn't mean that you were just upset that you could wait till your regular time for confession. Probably if he went into confessional, he would never get out, you know, there'd be so many people coming. So he said, you could wait for your regular time of confession. I know you didn't mean it. You know, and I feel that way about him myself a lot, he said. <laughs> so the man, and so the, <laughs> the man as he was walking away, he said, you know, if only there were more pre priests in a church like you, and his church would be filled with people. Uh, no, <laughs> so, he was very compassionate, very compassionate. I brought oh, yeah. something else. You talk about his, his, uh, his statue and whatnot. He was often on TV uh, just by himself, so people yeah. often, when they met him in real life, didn't often find out, uh, realize what his statue was, because he, he sort of would look sort of imposing. He'd look into the camera and he had that big cape. But uh, through the grace of one of his relatives, uh, we were given uh, this. This was in the office. This is was actually, it was supposed to be one of his favorite sweaters, his red, uh, yeah. red sweater. So I took uh, this out and I looked at the size of it. Now, I'm, my name is small, and it's the only small thing about me. <laughs> but if you look at this little sweater, it sort of doesn't correspond to both the voice and the presence and the gaze and the look and whatnot. Right. But uh, I suppose the Lord does wonderful things with uh, deceptively uh, small packages. That's right. Uh, yeah. But uh, you would have yeah. obviously met him several times in your yeah. own life. And, yeah. Yeah. and they, people say that when he looked at you, his eyes would... Uh, in a, in a loving way, you, you felt that you were the only one within his within his eye shot, yeah, uh, yeah. which is what I think 
seemed to touch so many people in a personal way. Oh, absolutely, yes. Many people talked about that when he looked at you. Some said he, they felt he was looking right into their soul, you know, because he had those deep penetrating eyes, you mm. know. Uh, but he certainly was a great man. I, I do believe he had the gift of prophecy. You know, he said things to so many people I've met uh, about their future, and th they had no way to know without the gift of, you know, prophecy from God how these things could ever happen, you know. Uh, I, I was sharing with you that story about the woman who told me she, she knew him, and when she got married, she had a, a son, and he told her, he said, um, uh, why don't you name him Matthew? And she said, well, I, I don't know if I like that name. He said, well, you're going to have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Peter, and Paul. Wow. She had Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, John and Peter and Paul. Wow. She had six sons, and, and she named them just named like he them. said wow. she would. Isn't wow. that amazing? Now, that how, is. How, that how, is amazing. How could she? You know, and then he even foretold remember, Stalin's uh, That's right. death That's on right. one of the programs. Uh, you know, he but said he, your death will come soon. He, he, he had the presence. He took the time for the little things. Uh, you know, I would imagine when you get at that level and you're with presidents and you know prelates and all that sort of stuff. Uh, it's easy to sort of forget the guy who's working the elevator, yeah, or the, the you know the shoe shine on the corner, or the person who was cleaning the offices. I brought a little book uh, that he had, and he took on his missions with him. This has sort of symbolized it for me. Uh, of course, you know he was a great lover of his holy hour, committed to his. Oh, holy Oh, absolutely. Hour. Oh, yes. And I have sure. a little a little uh, piece from him when he was in. Uh, he would take this on his mission trips. This is when he was in Nairobi in, 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 uh, in Kenya. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it says, uh, uh, had engine trouble. <laughs> 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 had engine trouble, disembarked, uh, got back on again, uh, hotel, slept till 10, holy hour mass, uh, delayed flight, took off, nice. So, I mean, he had a great detail about uh -huh. how he spent every moment of his day. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, and he recorded that and at the back of the book, which is fascinating. He's talking about a bishop that he obviously met on his travels. Uh, bishop will arrive on the Queen Elizabeth, January 18th. Uh, and what he would do is he would send somebody, or no, no, he wouldn't send somebody, he'd go himself uh, to meet with people. Uh, if he said that he was going to send somebody a book, he would write their name and address. He would send them the book. He would send them a card. So he was a man, as I say, 99% perspiration. If he said he was going to do something, mm. he did it. And mm -hmm. I think a much of life would be a lot better mm -hmm. if we just fulfilled our commitments to one another. That's right. That's right. Kind of reminds me of a, he's got a, a daily to-do list there, you know, and, uh, or have done list too, you know. But uh, it's amazing, and as you pointed out too, uh, Father Andrew, his fidelity to his uh, holy hour before the Blessed Sacrament, uh, which he said uh, he wanted to uh, do that, you know, to keep him faithful in his priesthood, you know. Um, and, and he offered it up. He said this, to like, uh, he always summarized the three reasons for that holy hour. One, because Jesus asked for it. Remember, he asked the apostles, could you not watch and pray one hour with me? So he said the friendship of Jesus calls us to that holy hour. Secondly, he said it's uh, to, to um, uh, be transformed. He said, you, you pray before the Blessed Sacrament, Jesus will fill your mind with good thoughts, transforming the way you think. You'll fill your heart with love, transforming the way you love, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then finally, um, he said, it's also an hour to pray for souls. And I'm, I'm sure mm -hmm. a lot of the people he affected, he must have prayed for, mm -hmm. you know, people watching his show. And, mm -hmm. so many, and you still meet so many, many people, like you said, mm -hmm. who have been affected by him. His voice, you know, one of the one things that I think his canonization would be so important so that his voice will never go silent. Sure. In the Catholic Church, we, yeah. we can't afford to lose yeah. the, the brilliant things that he has said and holy things. Of course, we have uh, we share that uh, place on the uh, on the Archbishop Sheehan Foundation, uh, with lots of resources. Also, for his missionary activity and prayers and reflections are on our own website for the propagation of the faith, which can be mm -hmm. found at onefamilyinmission.org for those who are interested. It's just it's one word, one spelled out, one family in mission. Uh, dot org, and you can find out. And of course, he was the great uh, writer and publisher of Mission Magazine, which many people would yes. know about back in 1950. 
mm -hmm. uh, when he, he, he rejigged that. So uh, lots of ways to stay in touch with Sheehan. Good, good, Jim, because, you know, it's, it's so important, first of all, for the people who have known him, renew their, their acquaintance with him, so to speak, renew the influence that he may have had on them. I remember as a young boy watching mm -hmm. him. My Italian, my old Italian grandfather used to watch him. He said, watch this man. I don't know how much he understood <laughs> what Bishop Sheehan was saying, but he encouraged me and my brothers to do that. And uh, he left a deep impression on a lot of people. Good. Well, Good. well, Father Andrew, we're going to have to take another little break here. So don't leave us. We're going to be right back. We've got some beautiful things to share with you. Welcome back to Sunday Night Prime. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, and tonight our very special guest is Father Andrew Small, who is the National Director of the Pontifical Mission Societies, uh, the Propagation of the Faith. Father Andrew, it's been really uh, a great program talking about uh, your own background and Bishop Sheen, uh, what a legacy that he has given. Well, what is the state of the missions now? You are, you know, as a director, you're, you sort of have your finger on the pulse, or at least, uh, you know, you're, you're new at, fairly new at the work, and, but I'm sure you're being very aware. Uh, what, what's, uh, what do you see our challenge today? Uh, how is this fitting in with the year of faith and evangelization? Well, thank you for that opportunity, and maybe begin, just give a little distinction. When people say the missions, they think, well, isn't everything the missions? Is we have home missions, we have extension society, we have, you know, Catholic relief services. Uh, we have all sorts of groups that are sure. helping folks. Mm -hmm. So what's the what's the distinction between them? Why this and not that? And what's your mandate and what's their mandate? That type of thing. Uh, you rightly said the societies, Father. Thank you for keep saying that pontifical mission societies. One of them is the propagation of the faith, which supports 1,150 dioceses around the world mostly in Africa and Asia. And those would be dioceses that we call mission dependent, meaning that they don't yet have enough infrastructure, seminarians, priests, sisters, to contain themselves. Uh, so they depend on people from outside and they depend on finances from outside. While the faith might be strong, the structures are still a little weak. Uh, mm. uh, they, they don't have sufficient chapels and churches and whatnot. There's 1,150 of those, they're called mission dependent. Uh, and we, uh, as the United States, but all, the hundred, my 120 colleagues from all around the world, national directors, mm -hmm. all of them, raise funds so that we can support those 1,150 dioceses. We're talking about 10,000 orphanages. We're talking about 80,000 seminarians. We're talking about a massive, massive operation, which the church undertakes year in, year out, Mm -hmm. It's there yesterday, it's there today like Christ, and it will be there tomorrow. We don't just go in and come out. And we're there with the people, th in the people, and through the people, celebrating the sacraments, and that's an important part of what mm -hmm. we do. Society of St. Peter Apostle, another one of the societies, supports the training of, of uh, seminarians in those mission countries. In fact, if you go to Mass on Sunday in the United States, there's a chance you might have a priest from Africa uh, helping out in the local yes, parish. that's right. You know who helped train them back home? Society of the St. Peter Apostle. As I say, this is one sure way for Americans to get their own back, to get their own back. They're the ones who help train these seminarians in Nigeria or Kenya or wherever it might be. And now they're helping us uh, as mm -hmm. we're celebrating the sacraments fully yeah. here in the U.S. And then there's the, the, what we call the Holy Childhood or Missionary Childhood Association. Many people remember that from their youth. Mm -hmm. uh, helping children, schools, uh, after-school programs, school feeding programs, children to be missionaries to children. Is that so when you adopted? We used to talk, speaking of adopting. We, talk, we used to talk, and we talked last time yeah. about the famous pagan babies. Huh? Oh, yeah. Which, yeah. which came from a very good place in people's hearts. Uh, it might not be the terminology we use today. Right. But, you know, in a certain sense, we're all pagans if we're not yet uh, uh, branded with that sacrament of baptism that, that, uh, uh -huh. that washes away the, uh, the sin and Adam's fault. Uh, we just celebrated in Easter. So it was, a, it was a terminology of its time, but it was basically children recognizing that they are their brother's keeper. They are their sister's keeper. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, I don't see what could ever go out of fashion with that, teaching children mm -hmm. to care for their brothers and sisters around the world, especially those who maybe don't have uh, what they have. So that's really what we do. But of course, we do it through the centrality of, of the faith. Right. We preach Christ and Him mm -hmm. crucified. Mm -hmm. Without that, well, it's like, it's like being without love. Mm -hmm. We're a clashing cymbal, we're a clanging gong. Right, we're nothing. Right. That's right. Without if love, we that's don't right. have that, that presentation of Christ and His cross. As Christ is crucified in many places in the world today. Uh, and we see that. And through our work and through the work of very generous Catholics here in the United States, we're able to reach out to uh, many folks. I was in, uh, I, I try and spend Christmas in a, in a different mission country. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one mission diocese in the United States. It's in Fairbanks, Alaska, uh, oh, yeah. which yeah. is where I went my first year, very chilly, 40 degrees below. Uh, and <laughs> Cold. Yet, they all go out and visit around. This year I was in Egypt, believe it or not, and Egypt's in the news right now because of the pressure that the Christians are feeling under the new government. Um, persecution, frankly, let's just put it right mm -hmm. out there. Uh, they don't have this room and the space to say mass. They're not allowed to open their own churches. Uh, they have to say mass sometimes in a in a hall somewhere in the hope that they're not being discovered. This is this is a real problem. These are real contemporary martyrs and and and, and people who are uh, you know, suffering. Yes, they are. There are yeah, there are brothers and sisters there. Bishop Sheen used to say, because of that, what they are suffering, they're pouring more strength into the mystical body of Christ. Remember when St. Paul said, when one member is healthy, all the other members share in that. And of course, the, the suffering church uh, has brings so many merits and graces uh, to the, all, all, the whole rest of the mystical body. So those who are sick, those who are spiritually, uh, though, uh, even physically too, who are in mm -hmm. physical need, mm -hmm. but spiritually, uh, those who are d disconnecting from the mystical body, the graces of all those suffering in the missions, mm -hmm. you know. It's just amazing to see. I think of some countries where our people are so persecuted uh, for their faith, and I wonder these poor brothers and sisters in Christ, what they are going through, you know, uh, and, and yet they're faithful, and we are beneficiaries of that, you know. As Bishop Sheen used to say, in the East, under communism and so on, he said they had a cross, they had dedication to a cause, they had, you know, but they had no Christ. And he says, we, we have Christ, but we have no cross, no more discipline, you know, no more self-denial, no, no more dedication to the cause of our faith. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to revive in the year of faith. And he said, they will help us to get our faith back. So we it's should be beautiful. grateful and pray for them too and for one another. Of course, we have a new mission, a new chief missionary, <laughs> Father Andrew. That's what we like to call our Holy Father. He has many, many titles. He's uh, <laughs> known by himself as Bishop of Rome. That's the title that uh, people are mm -hmm. focusing on. Uh, Supreme Pontiff, uh, uh, successor to St. Peter, all these titles. But one of them which we embrace is chief missionary. Uh, our beloved uh, now uh, Pope Emeritus uh, Benedict XVI was the um, uh, was the collaborator of Bishop Sheehan during the Second Vatican Council mm -hmm. on the document that talked about the missionary activity of the Church, in which they both drafted these these documents. He said that the Church is missionary by a very nature. Now, as you know, when you define something by its nature, it means that without it it wouldn't be what it is. So there is no church uh, without the missions. Right. And we have now a chief missionary, a new chief missionary, who I think we've seen uh, many commentaries going on, but this is a man you said at the beginning, sent. So you're sent out, right? The second person of the Trinity was sent out to go. Yeah. To what? To find the lost sheep. He senses a mission, doesn't he? You know, you can see that in the way he's doing things. He's, he's got his own approach and that he's supposed to have. He has to have that. Uh, but he keeps challenging us, you know. Uh, I, I know that uh, when he washed the feet of those young people in the detention center on Holy Thursday, some people were a little bit critical. Why did he do that? Why didn't he do the ceremony in the Vatican? But Remember, uh, he's, when he was the archbishop there in Buenos Aires, he, he went to prisons, he went to hospitals, and, 
And he told the cardinals, he said, uh, I want you to go out, go out to the people. And, and you know, uh, that's exactly, when he took the name Francis, uh, St. Francis, you know, he, he was a, a great reformer. He was told by Christ on the cross of San Damiano, Francis, go and rebuild my church. That's right. And I thought of that immediately when the Pope uh, took that name. I said, you know, maybe he's conscious that uh, as Pope Benedict was saying, you know, the, the things in the church that need reform, you're going to have to do it. May my, remember, I think the Pope Benedict said something to the effect, may my successor have the strength of wisdom to be able to meet these challenges. Right. So, uh, and I know he spoke with him about a week after the Pope Francis uh, had become Pope, and I'm sure they talked about these great challenges. So he is going to have to go in the spirit like, Saint, like Christ sends St. Francis. And he did it first. Francis reformed the church by living the gospel, right. you know, making it come alive for yeah. people. And that's what we have to have. But then you can preach right. the gospel. You know, even when he, remember, he went to the mission, St. Francis. You know, I think St. Francis right. was the first saint founder who ever had in his rule uh, a certain chapter just for the missions. He said, if there's any friar who feels inspired by God to go to the missions, he has to ask permission. Right. And the, the, the superiors of the order had to evaluate whether that person really was capable of handling that kind of work. And he went to the, you know, to the Muslims and preached to them. That's and, right. And uh, <laughs> the Muslim, the Muslim, the, the sheikh in charge of the Muslims was so impressed. He said, if only all the Christians came like you, we would have joined you. That's right. That's so, right. Because I was claiming the uh, Francis Xavier for a little while uh, before he <laughs> oh, made it very clear. Yeah. It was Il Poverello, who was the poor man from Assisi. <laughs> but yeah. was Francis Xavier is the great uh, patron yes. of the missions. Yes. So, uh, so yeah. we like that. But no, he made it very clear. Um, you know, as you say, he told his his, his fellow bishops back in uh, back in Argentina, you know, do something, go be with the poor. That's how you honor this this inauguration of my ministry. People were saying his line was, uh, "Don't fly for me, Argentina." You know the famous l line from the song, "Don't cry for me, Argentina." Please mm. go out, go to the periphery. Uh, there you will find Christ. Huh? Mm. Have you met Christ? Go meet him in the in the poor person. Uh, the one who is suffering. And he sort of has this genuine sense of joy with that. You know, I, I was telling the story there. I, I got a chance in my previous position to go to Argentina. and I met him in, um, mm. in, his, uh, in his house, which is just next to the cathedral. Very, I think he did in Argentina what he's doing now. His own, his own house was a small apartment where he would cook for himself. But then when he had official visitors, he would go and, and visit with them in the, in the official residence. residence. Yeah. And I think that's what he seems to be doing now in, mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in Rome. He uses the Apostolic Palace uh, for meeting this, his uh, high-ranking guests. So anyway, it turns out that it wasn't me. It was Cardinal O'Malley. I was with Cardinal O'Malley from Boston. Uh -huh. And uh, we went to Sunday afternoon. He said Mass. Cardinal O'Malley said Mass in the morning, Sunday afternoon. So we're ringing the bells, a big iron gate on the front of the, the residence for the Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires. So ringing the bell, ringing the bell, I thought, I must have got something wrong. And there's the Cardinal O'Malley standing there, and I'm sweating a little bit, shuffling. Finally, the priest comes out, and he has a big bunch of keys, and he, he opens the gate, and uh, we come in and shake hands, and then he moves us, and he closes the gate, and he, he takes us up the steps, and I'm sort of wondering, well, where's the Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos mm -hmm. Aires? Where's Cardinal Bergoglio? And Cardinal O'Malley looks at me and he says, that's Cardinal Bergoglio. <laughs> It's absolutely, for me, it's absolutely true what they're saying. He yeah. has a, just a natural, no-nonsense simplicity, which in a spiritual sense means that he wants to remove those obstacles that separate us from God, that we put yeah. in the way. Yeah. And that he wants to separate those obstacles, to take out those obstacles that separate us from one another. Mm. So many things we can put in that clutter yeah. up our lives. Mm -hmm. And I think his simplicity, he's not being uh, sort of, as they say, the kids say, in your face. You know, he's not trying to make a big statement. It just seems such a natural way that he has. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're learning a lot from him. And as our chief missionary, he's saying, don't be remaining here inside yourself. Don't be, as they say, self-referential. Don't see the world according to your wants and hopes and desires. Move out of yourself. And that is, as you said at the beginning, that's the mitere, that's the missus. That's, That's right. the apostolos, the being sent mm -hmm. uh, out of yourself, out of your comfort zone yes. to the other who needs you. That's right. We, we certainly need that. We need that, that missionary spirit. Um, 
I mean, you know, you look at the, like St. Therese. Now, she's the other patron, patroness of the missions, right, uh, along with St. Francis Xavier. And she never left, left that convent, uh, the cloister. But look at how many souls she saved. But she had that spirit of wanting to go to the mission. She wanted to sacrifice herself. But she did what she could do, you know. And that's a very important reminder to all of our listeners, you know. Do what you can do. That's right. Uh, you know, uh, I remember Mother Teresa, a, a woman got in touch with her. Now, there's a great missionary, huh? Uh -huh. Mother Teresa going all around the world and bringing Christ. And, and this a lady said to Mother Teresa, Mother, I wish I could do what you do. And Mother Teresa, you know, has, she always had a very simple answers, but they just, <laughs> just knock you right over. And she said to the woman, well, you do what I can't do. I'll do what you can't do, mm -hmm. but together we'll do something beautiful for wow. God. And you know, that's, wow. uh, that's the way it works. Wow. And uh, there are going to be those who are going to be out there in the missions and actually, you know, doing the preaching in the foreign missions or home missions. And, but everyone can be a missionary. You said it before the program, That's right. Mother's quote, that That's you don't right. have to go to a foreign land or That's something. That's right. Now, so the, 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 the saying we have in, uh, in the propagation of the faith is some give to the missions by going themselves, but some go to the missions by giving of themselves. Right. And you can do that obviously financially, but also spiritually. And sure. that's what I think is that great comparison you made between the two great patrons of the missions, Teresa uh, of Lisieux, the little flower, who hopefully we might have uh, a chance to venerate some of her relics uh, on her feast day this year, uh, October 1st. Wonderful. You know, her feast day. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, Francis Xavier, whose famous arm is there in the Jesu, baptizing thousands uh, through, through his efforts. But a man mm -hmm. who left his land without the promise of ever returning. Mm -hmm. You know, when you think about real sacrifices, you know, everything today can seem so provisional and temporary. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as we sit at our computer screen, if we make mistakes, well, we can just go back and, and, and correct the record. Uh, or politicians say, well, I didn't mean that. You know, uh, well, you did, but now mm -hmm. you're saying you wish you hadn't said it. Or <laughs> yeah, something right. like that. <laughs> That's normally what happens. But as you said about, about uh, Archbishop Sheehan, Venerable Fulton Sheehan, uh, he was one take. That's right. And life, in some sense, mm -hmm. is one take. Now, when we fall down, we can get up and we look for the Lord's forgiveness. He'll never let us down in His mercy, Pope Francis said. That's right. We let ourselves down by forgetting to ask for His mercy. Mm -hmm. And that's a key distinction. But this is, this is the one moment we have, and, 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 and let's use it well, and, and, and let's perspire like Archbishop Sheehan did, uh, giving all for the sake of the gospel. Right, right. He, he kind of reminds me of those beautiful words of St. Paul. I've spent my life, you know, I poured it out in the, in the service of the gospel and uh, like a libation, and he wanted to do that. And somehow that spark was in Bishop Sheen. Uh, I know he used to say, um, when people praised him as a great speaker, uh, he would say, no, I, it's, I have no natural talent for that, but he said, it comes from my holy hour, that time before the Blessed Sacrament. So we encourage people in prayer, his love of Our Lady, too. Wasn't that an extraordinary love? He had great writers. You know who his great writers were? <laughs> yeah, who was that? Tell them. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> I, I, yeah. And so he had the best of them. And, uh, and so we have to, you know, to uh, being conscious that we, too, have to take those writings of those same writers. And just as he did, he made them part of himself through prayer, through time before the Blessed Sacrament, through his prayers to Our Lady, and, and he became like the Mother of God who took Christ to others. Sure. You know, I remember uh, a Cambodian missionary, I don't know if I mentioned it, I know I mentioned it before the program, but I don't think I mentioned it during the program, that he was traveling to the missions, I believe it was in Africa, and he got to this Cambodian mission at 2.30 in the morning, and he didn't ask for a bed, and he didn't ask for a meal. He asked, where is the Blessed Sacrament? Mm -hmm. 2.30 in the morning. His heart was so faithful to the promise that he had made, you know. So that's why the missions, he brought home so many, he used to tell so many stories. Uh, I remember one of my favorite stories that he told, he wasn't involved in it directly, but it, it was a, I believe it was a Dominican bishop in the Pakistan that had been imprisoned during the Second World War de detention center. And a young girl from his diocese came to see him and uh, she said to him, Bishop, you're going to be let out of prison on this particular date. 
And he said to her, how do you know that? She said, I've offered my life for you. Mm. Well, that particular date came, and with no explanation, you, the, the, those in charge of the prison opened the gate and said, you're, you're free to go and to exercise your ministry. Mm. And so first thing he did, he went to the house of that little girl, and she had died that morning. Wow. You know, and he used to tell that story, great inspiration. Mm -hmm. huh? So his love of the missions. Well, Father, we're getting close to the end of the program. I know we had talked about wanting to share one of his beautiful quotes. Oh, Would sure. you like to yes. share that from his Mission yes, Magazine? Don't. Yes, he, re he refounded Mission Magazine, which we still send out today. I and mean, then you can come to our website and we'll send it. It gives you great stories from the missions back in 19, the spring of 1951. Mm -hmm. He said this, The poor of the missions need the comfortable to supply roofs for their churches, medicines for their hospitals, clothes for their backs. But the comfortable need the poor in order that they might have the blessing of God in their hearts, the charity of Christ in their souls, and the intercession of the poor, who are the friends of God. What a great closing statement huh, for our program. Huh? Yes, the poor need us to help them in their need, but we need them to experience then the greatness of God. Well, Father, we've come to the end of this wonderful program, and uh, we had said we would give a, a con-celebrated blessing why today. Not, so not? may the Lord bless all of you and we're going to ask Almighty God, let us pray. May Almighty God bless you all in the name of the Father, Father and of the, the Son and, and of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. May your love of the missions be great like Bishop Sheen's. God love you. Well, now we come to that part of the program where we do our little fundraiser and, uh, you know, to, to speak about the needs um, uh, of the EWTN. You know, we're talking with, with Father Andrew Small about the missions, and Mother Angelica was inspired by God to start EWTN. He gave her the, um, the graces and even the finances necessary to get started. There's wonderful work. And uh, supporting all our missionaries, too. How many people, by seeing EWTN uh, in the mission fields uh, as well as the home front, uh, learn about their faith? But we can't keep that going unless we have your support. We need your prayers, certainly, at EWTN. That God will bless the station and all its work, as well as the missions and their work. But we need your financial support. So remember what Mother always said, put your check for EWTN between your payment for your, your electric bill and your telephone bill. Thanks so much. God love you.